Now, when we talk about effective upstream and downstream passage, what we're looking at is some percentile of the run. Generally speaking, rule of thumb, grab it out of the air, is 95%. 95% of the fish that show up at the base of the dam that want to move upstream should be able to move upstream in a relatively short period of time and on the downstream side of things, relatively the same, 95% effective downstream passage. That is the goal, that is the federal goal, that is the guideline that we operate by. That's how it should work. Now you gotta remember, fisheries restoration, <clears throat> nationally, globally, is still in its infancy, okay? As a profession, as an, as an ethos, we've only just started, really, even though, you know, as I stated earlier, we've been talking about this for going on 200 years plus. I have a letter from the Library of Congress written by a citizen in the town of Winthrop, Maine, to the great and common, you know, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, begging to open the river back up because all their fish disappeared because they built dams on the Cabasacani drainage and stopped all the fish from coming up. And this particular person, this is in 1757, you know, and the farmers up there and the folks up there. You gotta remember these fish came right to your doorstep. Initially, I guarantee you 200 years ago, everybody in this room where we actually sitting here 200 years ago would know exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about alewives, shad, eels, all these particular species of fish. Because 200 years ago, I guarantee you, you were a farmer and a fisherman and whatever else you had to be just to survive here, you know? There wasn't much wealth here. And most of the wealth that was generated here, in fact, all of the wealth that was generated here was natural resource based. Came from here, the trees came from here that made the ships that brought the products like the Kennebec ice all around the globe. So, the, you know, this idea, you know, about dams and their removal it's still part of the greater landscape of the economy of the state of Maine. You know? The state of Maine officially does not advocate for dam removal. We advocate for passage in, you know, in restoration of fisheries populations. You can ask me personally what I think about it later. Any other questions on this wicked cool exponential graph? All right, there's some numbers to think about. Alewife potential. Pay close attention to the St. Croix River. Just the Kennebec River alone is well over 11 million adult individuals. I could tell you what the juvenile production from that would be, however, there would be a lot more zeros added to that number billions upon billions upon billions upon billions of juveniles. And that trophic cascade that we looked at with those grossly large apex predators at the beginning starts to get a lot broader. Much, much broader. <coughs> many, many more species involved from the smallest of bacteria and piscivorous insects and trust me, there's a bunch of them reptiles, amphibians, they all get in the mix when it comes to the juveniles because they're small and they fit in your mouth easily. So we're looking at, you know, a, you know, a minimum of 54 million adults coming back to the state annually, historically, based on available habitat. And we're down at just a mere shadow of that still. The St. Croix, we could bring back at least, you know, three to five million fish in four years to five years at most, where it's taken us 20 years to get where we are today on the Kennebec because the St. Croix run was extirpated by the stroke of a pen. There was fish passages in most of the dams, a great deal of habitat available, but because once again, in Maine, this is a very unique state because we have a very, very powerful citizens lobby here that's not that's not true in many other states. 
where you had a very tiny group of very vocal sport fishermen, guides, who somehow thought that alewise were impacting their smallmouth bass fishing. Smallmouth bass are fun to catch. They jump and they fight like the dickens, and they're pretty good to eat, too. But the cause and effect clause came into, into being, and what they saw was lots of little tiny silvery fish, a decline in their smallmouth bass population, ergo lots of tiny little silver fish, meaning the decline in your smallmouth bass population. So they got a hold of their representatives. And with the stroke of a pen, the fishways were closed. And that ended a uh, run of L lives of well over three million individuals. Not only that, it was an international waterway. What they did was most likely illegal, the state legislature. And that stands to this day. That river is still closed. They're still fighting. Still. In fact, I got contacted by Art Spies, who was looking at some bones out of Mud Lake, which is part of the St. Croix Basin, right on the border. And uh, he wanted to make an absolute determination that these calcified bones that were from a thousand plus year old archaeological site were indeed river herring. Eighty some odd miles up into the St. Croix. Now I guarantee you the Indians didn't carry them there in a basket. They swam there and were captured there. You know, and eaten there. So what he wanted was a shad, so I gave him the shad, the American shad, which is much larger, and he took the shad all apart, and sure enough, they were alewife bones. But don't confuse the legislature with facts, okay? Because it doesn't work that way. Again, this tiny group of guides hijacked one of the largest river herring runs on the eastern seaboard and made it go away and it's still gone. Any questions on this really cool map? Hey, who's working on getting that alewife run back anyway? Uh, this group I know, <laughs> uh, Friends of Mary Meeting Bay has been advocating to open up the St. Croix. Wish us luck. What year was that closed down? I think it was 96. I think five would say five. Yeah. And then an, an effort to reopen in 2005, and yeah. the legislators freaked out and uh, didn't reopen. No. Didn't reopen. And much can be said, you know, about the St. Croix. The politics. You know, we call it. Biolitics, you know, where they ignore the, the actual reality of what they're messing with and they basically mess with this giant ecological machine and damn the consequences. So what was the political tool that they used to do that? Was it a state law? That yes, was yes it was. Yeah, you know, they closed the fishways down. They put hydraulic jumps in. Salmon can easily surpass the jumps, but alewives aren't very good jumpers. Lamin are swimmers, they're incredible, but they're just not vertical jumpers. So that's what they did. It's important to note they don't just keep alewives out too. Right. So Right. You know? Any anyone else but a salmon, basically. Right. Any other species but salmon. So basically the run was legislated out of existence. This wasn't pollution. You know, you look at the trifecta of the reason these populations declined, you have overfishing dams and pollution. It's like a milk stool. You pull out any one of those and you're doing good. And you start seeing a rebound in the population. You know? Go ahead, though. What sustains the smallmouth bass, though? When oh. it's forage disappears like that. Well, there's not to say that there isn't other species there that the smallmouth bass, by the way, <clears throat> an introduced species. Okay, this is to support, you know, a quote-unquote recreational fishery, okay, like Disneyland, 
there's a big difference between Disneyland and the real world. You know, other things like the seals and the loons and the eagles and the ospreys and all that other stuff got to eat somewhere. You know, and you take away the alewife. I can't stress it enough. The enormous population potential of alewives and their ability as they feed on the primary level of production because they're zooplankters, planktivores, they eat the tiny stuff that feeds on the phytoplankton and you don't see anybody going to the restaurant and ordering phytoplankton. You know, they, they go and they get fish or they get chicken or they get steak. The alewives are the intermediary being that can eat that stuff, convert it into a much larger, larger food item which in turn supports this much greater network of animals. Go ahead. So, if you've got, let's say you prioritize the river. So you said, look, um, you know, St. Croix is important because it could have more than 22 million ALIs. Or you said the Androscoggin is important because it could have more than 2 million ALIs. So you, you prioritize those. Yeah. Some of them are. And yep. So then you say, okay, look, we're going to take the dams down. Now, when those ALIs go up, what if they are, what if there is urbanization on both sides of the river? Are they okay with just a river? Or do they need like solid buffers or habitat or something on the side? I mean, are they okay? I mean, probably the eagles wouldn't come out if there was a big city there. The eagles wouldn't come out to eat the ELO. But maybe the ELOs are okay and they just keep going upstream. I mean, does, does the urbanization at the mouth of the river bother them or do they need buffers too? No, no. Uh, we can speak directly to this because the ELOs burn by the cities of Bath and, and Augusta. So they don't really care. No. They're okay as long as they've Right. If, as long as they got an open corridor, they're they're gone. You know. Go ahead. Yeah, well, one important point you mentioned the trifecta of pollution being one. Mm -hmm. uh, that comes together with alewives because, as you mentioned, they're feeding at the zooplankton level. They're a very very clean fish. Yeah. So a very very clean source of food for anyone who eats them, as opposed to a predator eating a smallmouth bass or a carp or eel or any other fish that's been in the system for a long time and has a lot of historical legacy of contaminants. So it's, uh, that's, that can become a very good explanation for why, say, a bald eagle population in the St. Croix goes down when there are not enough alewives. It's not just a matter of the more alewives eat, they're eating other fish to some extent, but they're not clean fish. All right, well, we, go ahead. Do we know that there's a correlation Oh, it's been studied extensively. No, there's no direct correlation. There's a lot of things on the, particularly the St. Croix, and I'll touch on this briefly because we could grind on the St. Croix until we all pass out from the horror and the boredom. A lot of things were happening on Spednik Lake. Uh, one, it was a water supply for uh, basically what amounted to a paper mill. And so the paper mill would draw great amounts of water out of the lake. And strangely enough, you know, smallmouth bass, even though an introduced species, they have a fixed biological clock that runs in them. They spawn in the spring, much like the alewives do. They spawn in the near shore, littoral zone of the lake. And they have, you know, nests, and the males guard the nests, and it's all very endearing. And then the paper company sucks the water level down as much as 14, 18 feet. So basically you've denuded the entire shore zone of the na lake and basically brought it down to what amounts to the lunar landscape where there is nothing, okay, because all the near shore macrophytes, the plants and stuff that live near shore that supported all these huge zooplankton populations and the whole food web of the lake is virtually annihilated. And so you'll get these recruitment issues with your with your black fry, your small smallmouth bass, and little tiny, they look like a pumpkin seed with eyeballs on it. And so you draw the lake down and all the food production gets highly disrupted in the pond, your recruitment falls off. And that's just a piece of it, you know. The smallmouth bass are popular to catch. Spednik Lake was a popular place to catch smallmouth bass. The most popular time to catch smallmouth bass is when they're on the nest. So you're targeting these parents that are guarding their nest and catching them. 
Now there's plenty of predators, if we backed up, I can show you a whole list of predators that gladly gobble down smallmouth bass when they're small, you know, like white perch and yellow perch in particular. They're very good at nest robbing. In fact, they make a job of it, you know. So there was no direct correlation that we could figure out between the decline in the smallmouth bass population and the perceived increase in alewife population. There was only that cause and effect, and it's very easy, and people can get confused right away with cause and effect stuff. You see something, you see a perceived effect of that something, therefore the thing, first thing, you know, it's connected. But many times it's not connected at all. And in the case of Spednik and the smallmouth bass population, it's not connected. There were many other factors, and, that, and you're at the northern tier of the range of that smallmouth bass typically occupy. So there's many other abiotic factors such as three feet of ice and a long spring, you know, that can directly affect recruitment for the zero plus, you know, recruits. They're not X, X length by the time they go into winter. They don't live. They have to be so big. You know, all that played into it. We, you know, Theo Willis went up there and did exhaustive research, you know, mining what IFMW had for data on smallmouth bass which wasn't a terrible lot, but for the sake of brevity, because we're running over, there's no direct correlation. Causes of decline, we've already looked at it, lack of access to gradient habitat and overfishing. Here is the cause of decline. It's you. <laughs> okay? We are the cause of decline. This isn't some natural phenomenon. We're not talking about Krakatoa here. This is us and our direct impact on the landscape. Restoration actions, we've already talked about it. Trap, transfer, release, blah, blah, blah. Not rocket science. It's easy to do physically. Politically, it's extraordinarily difficult to do. I still hear echoes of the St. Croix, you know, in the Sebastopol Basin. Oh, they're going to ruin the fishing. You know, because people don't understand the role. Is that a lack of education on our part? Partially. But like I said, 200 years ago, everybody, even in Newport, knew what an alewife was and how important they were. Improve upstream and downstream fish passage. You gotta remember, most of the dams here in the Northeast are old. They were not purpose built, very few of them were. Okay? They were built to be hydromechanical, to use and generate so much shaft horsepower not kilowatts, okay? You get further up in the basin, you get a little bit more ambitious because nobody was living up there then. Then you get hydropower projects that were built, purpose-built for hydroelectricity. In fact, one of the first purpose-built dams for hydroelectricity was Fort Halifax. It was built to power the trolley system that brought the factory workers over to Lockwood so that they could manufacture textiles. That was one of the first ones in the state. It lasted exactly 100 years as built. Not to say they didn't repair it, but it was remarkable how robust those generators and turbines and shafts were and gates. It was really built. So, 1994, top picture, there's Edwards Dam. Bottom picture, Edwards Dam, gone. That was the first you know, FERC ordered, FERC licensed hydroelectric facility in the United States removed ever in the United States. That's the Fort Halifax Dam in 2008. And those are the machines taking it down in late 2008. And if you drive over the bridge today in Winslow, You'll see the powerhouse, but that's all that remains. The rest of the, the uh, concrete arch is gone, and the river is open up to Benton Falls. Here's something we haven't touched on yet, only briefly mentioning introduced species, because we have a plethora of them in this state. We have a long history as Europeans of trying to recreate where we came from. Uh, We've introduced northern pike. Those started in the Belgrades. They have now spread much throughout the Kennebec Basin. In fact, all over the state. Uh, white catfish are, are rampant in the uh, main stem Kennebec. 
all the way up to Waterville and all the way up to Benton. Uh, white catfish, by the way, get pretty big and they are pretty much omnivores. They will catch whatever they can or eat whatever they can catch. Uh, they're a species of great concern for us. Because, you know, the northern pike, while it's a horrifying apex predator, it is just that. It has a very, very fixed diet. It's almost entirely piscivorous. It chases other fish. Meanwhile, the white catfish will eat lots of things. Lots of things. That mm -hmm. came up in the pump. And as your typical goldfish, give it another two years, you'd never see it. It would turn brown, or at least the first generation would. You could see that thing from a mile away. Why it didn't get eaten prior to this, you know, we could see it from 50 yards away along the shore. What is that orange dot? You know, it was like Finding Nemo. <laughs> Common carp. Introduced in the late uh, 19th century as a sport fish here in the Kennebec. It never really quite took off. They are incredibly powerful and smart fish. They see you coming. Uh, they are also extraordinarily long-lived. And they will also eat anything that they can get in their mouth. But mostly they're bottom feeders. They go around. You can kind of see the mouth of the thing. It looks like a vacuum cleaner. Because it just sucks up you know, indiscriminately large wads of stuff and, and uh, vegetation and all the attached critters to the vegetation and the mud surrounding the vegetation and the sand surrounding the mud and whatever it can fit in its mouth and it filters it all out and swims off. What it's done, we think, has greatly affected water quality in some of the lower flushing rate rivers like the Eastern and the Muddy and the Abigadasset. You can see direct evidence uh, in several tidal flats. They look like they're pockmarked, like it's been hit with a thousand golf balls. And uh, those, that's the direct effect of the carp going around, sucking up big wads of stuff. So. That's it. Any questions? Oh, wait. Uh, this is something we... Uh, now, granted, I'm not... Uh, I'm no magician with the video camera. I'll just let this speak for itself. This was at Fort Halifax once it loads up. If it loads up. This is a mink at Fort Halifax. I'll pan back. Sorry about the shaky nature. That's the pump. That little green thing in the lower left hand side sucking away massively in the current. All the black stuff is alewise. See that blue hose? The alewife is nearly as big as the, the mink is. <laughs> Female with kids. And she did that several, several times a day. You know, And you wouldn't think for a second that that animal could survive in that maelstrom of fish and current, but repeatedly she'd come down jump in the water and come back with a fish. Thanks, folks.